Okay. Please help me welcome our speaker for the morning, Dr. Marla Gia, professor in the astronomy department and the physics department at Yale University. And I have been corrected until recently, director of the Yale Telescope Resources. Professor Gia obtained a BS degree in applied and engineering physics from Cornell University in 1995, her PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from the University of California <clears throat> at Santa Cruz in 2003. She has received many honors, including a Hubble postdoctoral fellowship, a Plaskett postdoctoral fellowship, an Alfred P. Sloan fellowship, and a John F. Guggenheim Fellowship. She joined Yale faculty in 2008 <clears throat> and in addition is currently a professor at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Professor Gia <clears throat> utilizes the world's largest telescopes to study the smallest galaxies in the universe. Her research is focused on understanding <clears throat> how the least luminous known galaxies formed and using these galaxies to understand the nature of dark matter and the underlying <clears throat> cosmology of the universe. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we should make special note of Professor Gia's Dedication to the idea that everyone should have an opportunity to participate in science. In that regard, she is on the executive board of the Warrior Scholar Project, and she also runs a summer program that provides research experience for veteran undergraduates. I hope that sometime during the morning, Professor Gia, you will tell us about both of these important initiatives. And with that, welcome, welcome Professor Marla Gia. Welcome again to the Greenway Talks online and to Palomar Observatory. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. We'll take questions at the end of the presentation and for that reason, right now, <clears throat> I'll ask everyone to turn off their microphones. And with that, Professor, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, can I can. Screen? Awesome. Thank you for that introduction. I, I really appreciate it. Um, it's a delight to chat with you today. I was saying it. I miss California quite a bit, although today I am in New England. I'm in Connecticut, and it is an absolutely glorious fall day crisp and the trees are just about starting to turn. Um, and so it, it um, it's fun to chat with you. So um, I actually took out some of that outreach stuff. I'll, I'll, if you remind me at the end of the talk, I'm happy to talk about um, the summer programs and Warrior Scholar Project, um, which are, are super fun uh, programs to help students who don't typically um, come through um, university to do research and to do um, astrophysics. But today I wanna to chat with you about a project um, that Palomar has been sort of very intimately connected with. It's a project that I've been doing for, it was born almost 10 years ago. Um, and we've really been doing most of the work in the last five years. And it has just, the, the main phase of the project has just completed in the last few weeks. And so I'm really excited to sort of give you the whole picture um, for the first time. I've also modified the talk a bit to, um, highlight where Palomar is. And so if there's a couple of bumps or anything, I apologize and just, um, you know, bear with me. So the project that I'll talk about today is trying to put our Milky Way and the satellites around our Milky Way in a little bit more cosmic context, in a little bit more cosmological context. Um, 
These are all these beautiful um, objects here are satellite galaxies, small galaxies that orbit around galaxies like our Milky Way. And so let me zoom out from that image and show a, an image that is a little bit more like our Milky Way. So this is Andromeda M31. Um, but this is the galaxy that we think looks most like our Milky Way. Although this is a gorgeous picture, when I think of Milky Way or Milky Way analogs, and in this project I'll talk about today, this is a lot more like what I'm talking about. So that little thing right in the center of the, the crosshairs is an analogous galaxy to our Milky Way. It has similar brightness and it lives in a similar environment to our Milky Way. Um, and what we are most interested in are the small galaxies in this circle, in this red circle, that are gravitationally bound to that Milky Way analog uh, and orbit around it. And what we want to do is use those small galaxies um, to ask a bunch of different questions about both how galaxies form, as well as some questions in cosmology. So let me just back up a quick second and talk about satellite galaxies. So again, this is probably something like what the Milky Way looks like. Um, the sun, the solar system, and most of the stars that we see in the night sky are all sort of within that, just the tip of that red arrow. Um, so we're out, you know, somewhere out in the um, suburbs of the Milky Way's disk. There are two objects in this image that I am most interested in, um, and that's those two things. So these two are satellite galaxies. This is NGC 205 and M32. These are small galaxies, something like 100 times less massive than the Milky Way. Um, they're galaxies in their own right, so the stars um, orbit around each other, and the ensemble of stars in each of those galaxies orbits around, in this case, M31. And these satellites tell us a lot of things about the Milky Way itself. And so zooming out here um, and looking in our local group, so here is the Milky Way and M31 over here. And you can see that each of these two massive galaxies has basically an entourage, a cohort of smaller objects, smaller galaxies that are orbiting around it. Our Milky Way um, has something like 60 known galaxies, small galaxies orbiting around it. And the other half of my research that I could give another whole talk on, but I won't, um, the other half of my research focuses on finding and studying the galaxies around the Milky Way. But for the moment, we'll just say there's 60 galaxies around the, the Milky Way that are known. And their proximity, the fact that they're so close to us, allows us to study the Milky Way satellites in great, great detail. And there are hundreds of papers a year written on using the Milky Way satellite to test lots of different things. So to test questions about uh, dark matter and how galaxies form, also testing things about how stars are formed in these galaxies. However, and um, this is where I will get to in a couple of slides, you know, we put so much weight into the Milky Way satellites because we can study them because they're just like right there. Um, what if the Milky Way satellites are slightly biased or slightly strange in some way? Um, that is, is there, um, are we somehow being misled by studying the Milky Way satellites um, to something, you know, to generalizing to more global things about the universe? And so the project that I will describe is trying to put these satellites, the Milky Way satellites, into a little bit of context to allow us to know whether or not the things that we learn from the Milky Way um, can apply more generally. So let me sort of hone in, what are the questions that we actually use um, the satellites to, to answer. And really those questions can be categorized into two ways. So questions about cosmology, dark matter, dark energy, and questions about galaxy formation, that is how do individual galaxies and stars form. So today I'm gonna focus on two questions, one from each of these categories. Um, the first question in the cosmology category is to ask, you know, a very big question, but the question is, what is the nature of dark matter? We know that dark matter makes up something like 80 or 90% of the total mass in the universe. At the moment, we don't know exactly what dark matter is. Is it a particle? If it's a particle, what is its mass? What is um, the physics around those particles? The second question I'll ask in the galaxy formation side is asking what processes make star formation stop in a galaxy. So 
Um, in galaxies, usually you see galaxies that are either forming stars vigorously or they're not. Um, and we'd like to know what are the processes that um, you know, move a galaxy from one side to the other, let's say. So focusing in first on the cosmology question, what is the nature of dark matter? The tool that we will use um, to ask this question, to answer this question is a fairly simple tool really, is just looking at the number of small galaxies to big galaxies. And you might ask, okay, small galaxies, big galaxies, how's that gonna tell us something about the nature of dark matter? And so to illustrate that, what I'm gonna do hopefully is show you a movie. If the movie doesn't work, I'll show you a slide. Um, but the movie is going to, it's a numerical simulation of the universe um, starting at very, very early times and allowing just gravity to do its thing to create a galaxy like the Milky Way. So fingers crossed that it runs. Oh, and it's running, that's awesome, yay. Okay, so what you're seeing um, are smaller things merging and forming a larger object right in the center, which will become the Milky Way. This is the process of hierarchical galaxy formation, which is just that small things, small galaxies form early on and they merge and collide to form the massive structures that we see today. So something like the Milky Way was formed from thousands of smaller galaxies merging and colliding to create the Milky Way disk that we see. And the satellites that we see around the Milky Way, the small galaxies around the Milky Way, are just remnants of that process. And if we waited another couple billion years, those satellites would fall into the Milky Way, the Milky Way would grow a little larger, and there'd be new satellites coming in. And so this process of galaxy formation predicts that there should be thousands of galaxies or small objects around the Milky Way. And depending on the nature of dark matter, the number of these satellites is very different. So for example, here is a very similar simulation so that you kind of see that cosmic web, the sort of filamentary structure. This is a simulation with the sort of canonical, the currently accepted form of dark matter. So right now we think our dark matter is a particle. It has the mass, something like a proton, um, but it only interacts gravitationally and a little bit with the weak force, but we won't talk about that. So it just interacts gravitationally. If I ran the same simulation, but instead of having the mass of a proton, I made it a little bit smaller mass with a little bit more energy, like it was a little bit, had a little bit more velocity, a little bit more kinetic energy, this is what we would see. And so this simulation you'll see is a little bit smoother. And what's happening is that the dark matter particles have a little more energy and essentially smooth out that very, very um, small scale structure. And so if I then go and circle, where galaxies are at the end of the simulation. The big things, those big circles, if you kind of compare um, back and forth, the big circles are basically the same, but it's the number of small galaxies that are very different. And this leads us to a pretty simple um, test where we can just measure the number of small galaxies to the number of big galaxies and actually constrain the particle nature of dark matter. Now, this is a totally extreme situation. And in fact, this side of the, the slide has already been ruled out by other things. But in a more subtle way, the number of small galaxies to large galaxies can tell us something new about the particle nature of dark matter. So coming back to my, um, my you know, sort of outline here, the tool will be counting the number of satellites around a Milky Way um, and we'll compare those back to simulation to see whether we can say something about dark matter. So that's the first thing that we'll do. The second thing we want to do with these satellite galaxies is to ask questions about star formation and, and how galaxies actually form. So the question is, why does star, forming stop, star formation stop in some galaxies? And so when we look at all galaxies, we, cannot, can, we can put them in two classes. Um, on one side, galaxies are actually are either actively forming stars or on this side, they're not forming stars. And in the Milky Way, we think that small galaxies are forming stars and as they come into the Milky Way environment, the Milky Way does something to quench star formation in those objects, whether it's by stripping out all of the gas, which is the raw material to make stars, or if it's to trigger star formation, it uses up all of its, um, its raw materials for stars and then it stops forming stars. 
In the Milky Way, we see two of the five brightest satellites are forming stars. Those are the Magellanic Clouds. And then all the rest of the satellites around the Milky Way are quenched, are, have ceased forming stars, and have ceased forming stars a fairly long time ago, at least a billion years or more. Um, and so it would be interesting to ask in other Milky Way environments, is that true? Um, you know, are there only a handful of satellites that are star forming? Um, and if that's true, what does that say about how stars are forming and how um, gas and stars interact in an environment like the Milky Way? So coming back here, the tool is going to be just looking at the number of star forming versus not star forming satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. Um, so the tool is that, and the observation is just to look at, and when I, uh, the word I'll use for galaxies that aren't forming stars is quenched. Um, so quenched galaxies, meaning that they are no longer forming stars. Okay, so these two questions have been asked in the Milky Way. Um, and we have answers for those in the Milky Way. So in the Milky Way, we see only a few star um, galaxies are, are star forming. In the Milky Way, the number of satellites around the Milky Way roughly agrees with simulations. But the Milky Way is just one. It's just a sample of one. And you can imagine the Milky Way sort of being drawn from a perfect distribution of Milky Ways. And the question is, is the Milky Way in some way strange or, or atypical or um, just a little bit off from the normal distribution of what a real Milky Way is? And if so, we need to adjust our models a little bit. And so one question you might ask is, all right, that's cool. How many Milky Ways do you need in order to properly answer these two questions to put the Milky Way in context? And so to do that, what we'll do is look at simulation. So this is a, a plot. So on the horizontal is brightness with um, uh, astronomers have wacky units and terrible numbers, but um, fainter galaxies are on this side and brighter galaxies are on the right. And the, hor the vertical axis is the cumulative number of satellite galaxies around a Milky Way in a simulation. The red line is the observed Milky Way satellites. And the sort of grayish lines are simulated Milky Ways. And so what the first thing you can see is that the red line isn't like totally in the middle of the simulated galaxies, but you know, it's like, it's close, right? It's not that far off. Um, the number of lines in this plot, the number of simulations is a few hundred. And so if we had a few hundred Milky Ways on this, we would be able to say definitively whether or not um, A, the simulations are different than the observations and where the Milky Way lies in this distribution. And so what we'd like to do is be able to characterize satellite populations around something of order 100 Milky Ways, certainly not five, you know, a thousand is probably overkill. Um, so about a hundred. Now, if we start thinking about a hundred Milky Ways, and we'll define a Milky Way as something that's vaguely the same brightness as the Milky Way and vaguely the same um, environment as the Milky Way. If we want to find a hundred Milky Ways, we actually have to go out fairly large in volume in the universe to just find enough of those. Um, and so then the question becomes, First of all, how far out in volume do you need to go in order to find 100 Milky Ways? And then if you do you know, identify those Milky Ways, how do you identify satellites around those Milky Ways? And so I'll just kind of jump ahead for a quick second and say that out to, um, to find 100 Milky Ways, we're gonna go out to a volume that's um, something like 50 megaparsecs, which I won't define that unless you know it, um, but basically they're NGC galaxies. So our hosts, our Milky Ways, will largely be NGC galaxies. Um, but finding the satellites around those things is going to be hard. So let me kind of walk through why finding satellites is hard. So the question is, how can we find satellites around these more distant Milky Ways? Let's first talk about how we find satellites around nearby things. So around the Milky Way itself, how do we actually find galaxies? Well. Up until basically when I got a faculty job, so up until about 2008, we found galaxies around the Milky Way, satellite galaxies around the Milky Way by looking at them and like literally looking on in the sky or looking on photographic plates. So here is an image of the two satellite galaxies around the Milky Way that you can see from the 
with your naked eye if you happen to be in the Southern Hemisphere. So those were the Magellanic Clouds. Um, the Magellanic Clouds, the large and small Magellanic Clouds are the biggest satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. Um, in photographic plates or in images, you can also see about 10 satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. So this is um, one of the smaller galaxies around the Milky Way, um, but you can see individual stars in that image and you can clearly say, oh yeah, that's a galaxy. As you go fainter and fainter, um, it gets a little bit more interesting, but that's not what the talk will be about today. So individual stars, as we get farther and farther away, we can still find galaxies largely by looking at their images. And so if we get farther and farther away, you can imagine a galaxy, you'll start moving it farther and farther away. You may not be able to resolve individual stars. And at some point, it'll look fairly smooth. So here is a galaxy. You can see the individual stars. Here is a galaxy. It's fairly far away. It's very smooth and blue, and you can't see anything, um, you know, so any obvious features. In this interim between these two things, there's a technique called surface brightness fluctuation. That is, you can sort of estimate how bumpy the image is, and that gives you an estimate of how far away it is. That is, you know, imagine here you see individual stars. If you move it a little farther away, the brightest stars start to sort of congeal together, but it still looks kind of bumpy. And so this technique of surface brightness fluctuations um, can get us out somewhat far in distance, um, can get out to a volume where there's maybe 10 or 20 Milky Way analogs, but not as far as we actually want to get. Um, so there's really a limit to how far this method can work. And beyond that, beyond that distance, you have to switch from looking at images to start getting spectra of galaxies, and that becomes expensive. So um, for more distant galaxies, we need to measure a spectrum. So here is an image, here's a galaxy and a star. If I put a prism or a grating um, on top of this, um, I can disperse the light. So this is now the same light from these two galaxies as a function of wavelength. This is in the red part of the optical wavelength regime. Um, this sort of bright one up here is the star. If I look at the brightness as a function of wavelength, there are transitions and bumps in the spectrum that tell me it's a star that's very close by. In this galaxy spectrum, there is a, you can kind of see a, a white line there. There are features in the spectrum that give me the distance um, to this galaxy. And so I really measure a velocity, a, a, a speed or a redshift. Um, and from that, if the galaxy is far enough away, that will give me a distance. But this is kind of expensive. So you might ask, well, what do you mean? What, I, why can't, why do you have to get a spectrum? How can you just look at a galaxy and tell what its distance is? So I give you a challenge. So why do we need to get a spectrum of a galaxy? Um, why is this difficult? So on the top row of gal our galaxies, um, two of the galaxies on the top row are fairly close by. The other, what is that, four, are about 100 times more distant, are much, much farther in the background. Same deal with the bottom ones. Um, and I challenge you to try and figure out which ones are very close by and which ones are more distant. You're not gonna, so I, I'll, I'll just give you the answer. Um, so guess which of these are, are nearby galaxies? So these two galaxies here of this row, um, in terms of distance, um, and this is megaparsecs, which I probably should have defined. It's you know kind of like, I don't know, millions of light years, but I can't remember, sorry. Um, these two galaxies are 10 times closer um, than these objects. Um, and on the bottom, these two objects, these two galaxies are much, much closer than these guys. And so without a spectrum, we wouldn't know their distance. And without a distance, we can't determine whether it's a lower mass satellite galaxy or a more distant bright galaxy. And so um, there have been a couple of efforts to get spectra of lots and lots of galaxies. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey um, in the 2000s and 2010s um, surveyed the entire northern sky and got spectra for galaxies down to a certain brightness. The brightness that the Sloan Digital Sky Survey provided spectra is roughly sufficient to find um, basically one bright satellite out to um, that volume of a few hundred uh, Milky Way analogs. So let me um, roll back and kind of summarize. So if we are looking for satellites around Milky Ways, we can do that around the Milky Way itself. 
Um, so we're using Resolve stars to find those satellites. We can find about 60 satellites around our Milky Way, but we can only do it for one Milky Way. If we use this technique called surface brightness fluctuation, we can do that and find satellites out to for about a 20 or so Milky Way light galaxies. That's as far as that technique goes. Um, and because there's a limit to our imaging, we can find somewhere between five to eight satellites around those 20 hosts. Now, there are probably 60 satellites around those, but they're much fainter and we, we don't have access to them. All the way on the other side, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey provided us spectroscopy so we could get distances. We can do that for about 300 Milky Ways, but the limiting magnitude, the limiting brightness of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey only allows us to get one satellite um, per host. And so none of these techniques or surveys allows us to get to that 100 that we were trying to get, but we're also trying to get enough satellites to have some sense of how many satellites are around a Milky Way. And so none of these cut it. And so that's where, um, the project that we developed a couple of years comes in. So the SAGA survey, and I'll, I'll tell you what that stands for in a second, um, is something that we came up with when these two techniques were just beginning getting started. We wanted to sort of fill in this gap where there were enough hosts so that we could do some statistics, but at the same time, get enough satellites so we could say something about the satellites themselves. And so this survey was born, it's called um, SAGA, which stands for Satellites Around Galactic Analogs. You've probably heard enough astronomy talks to know that if you've got a good acronym, it must be a good project. Um, and this sur uh, survey started about five years ago. Um, so the goal of this SAGA survey um, is to use the satellites to answer those questions that I started the talk off with. So to shed some light on galaxy formation and dark matter and to better put the Milky Way itself into some context. The observational goal is to characterize the satellite galaxy populations around 100 galaxies like our Milky Way. And to the limit that we will be able to do our observations, we would expect about five satellites around our, Milky, um, around our analogs. So the Magellanic Clouds and the three next uh, faintest satellites. So let me talk about the design of the survey, and then I will go and answer those two questions using the data that we have so far. So how do we actually define a Milky Way? Um, we'll define a Milky Way based on how bright it is. So we'll have a small interval around the Milky Way, so a little bit fainter and a little bit brighter than the Milky Way itself. We will also define it as uh, with some environment. So the Milky Way only has one bright neighbor, neighbor which is Andromeda. It doesn't have lots of super bright neighbors. It's also not in a fairly um, large void. And so we'll find environments that are similar. Um, we will also, uh, whoops. Um, we will also um, search for satellites out to a gravitational radius where the gravity of that Milky Way can no longer pull the satellite in. That is, we're going to search out in distance far enough away where we think those satellites are gravitationally bound and orbiting around that Milky Way. And we want to survey inside of that radius. And so at the distances that we have to go out to, so at this, you know, out to the Saga volume, this radius turns out to be about to be about a full degree around every host. That is like the whole full moon we need to survey around our Milky Ways. And that's gigantic, it's super huge. Um, and so out to a degree around our Milky Way hosts, if we just ask like how many galaxies are inside of this radius, um, within this one degree, there are typically a few thousand galaxies down to our survey limit. And so the game will be to try and figure out which of those galaxies are at the same distance as that Milky Way analog, and which of those galaxies are behind or are much farther, much more distant. And so just to kind of schematically show you what, what we're doing, and then I'll explain how we do it. Um, so here is the same kind of image, but now I'm, I'm actually plotting. The dots in this are all of the objects that are galaxies within one degree of a Milky Way host, a, Mil a Milky Way analog that's right in the center of that. So about 2,000 galaxies, 250,000, um, 200, 2,500 galaxies per square degree. 
Um, we are at, when we started the survey, we were only slightly clever. Um, we knew that we were going down to this direction where we'd only expect like two or four or five satellites around our analog. So going from 2,500 to four or five is, is um, a lot. We were a little bit clever when we started off um, the survey and we were able to do some fairly simple cuts in color. So we knew that things that were very, very red, for example, are most likely distant galaxies. And so we could confidently get rid of about a thousand objects that we didn't need to get spectra for um, and do complete spectroscopy in that region for all of our hosts. And that took a long time. We did that for about 10 or 12 Milky Way analogs. And then we realized we could be even more clever and started to do some more things, making some cuts to say, oh, these are definitely background galaxies. And now we only need to get spectra for about 200 galaxies for each of our hosts. Again, the, the goal here is that the imaging is easy, the spectroscopy is hard. So for each of these Milky Way hosts, if I'm trying to get to 100, I need to get spectra for 200 to 400 galaxies. How do you do that? Well, the first thing you do is try and do it efficiently and multiplex in a way. So what we do is we go to two telescopes, one in the Northern Hemisphere and one in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, these are the MMT and AAT, so that's um, a telescope in Arizona and a telescope um, in Australia. These have instruments on it that have multi-fiber, large degree fields of view. And so both of these have about two, 300 to 400 fibers. We can place those fibers each on one of our candidate um, satellite galaxies. And in two or three hours of exposure time, we can get three or 400 spectra at a time. And so we will go and do that for a single Milky Way host. However, in these multi-fiber kind of things, we can't put a fiber on all of our candidates. And even worse, our faintest and um, lowest surface brightness and often highest priority satellites may not get a spectra um, in these fiber spectrographs, which are fairly, um, uh, they lose a lot of light. And so since we often miss the faintest galaxies, this is where Palomar has been absolutely critical to fill in the gaps where these multi-fiber surveys can't get. Um, and so what we do for a, a given Milky Way analog is we go, we get spectra and these multi-fiber things. We reduce it, we analyze it, and then we realize we missed five or 10 galaxies that are absolutely critical. We go to Palomar, we'll get single slit spectra. We use the, um, the double slit spectrograph. Um, at Palomar to get spectra, to get redshifts, that is to get distances for our usually most, um, most important faintest candidate satellites. And so we've so far had 45 nights on Palomar over the last five to eight years um, to fill in uh, this, this coverage. So let me just kind of summarize the survey and where we are now. Um, so the survey was envisioned in three stages. The first one is that we were gonna use just kind of get spectra for everything so that we could learn how to make sure we weren't missing any satellites. That was our stage one. And that happened and was completed uh, now five years ago in 2017. So we had complete spectra for everything possible for about eight hosts. We then got a little wise and learned how to select these galaxies a little bit more efficiently. That allowed us to get up to 36 hosts. And so that, um, that's a paper that just came out last year. And as I said, just a couple of weeks ago, we finished our full survey um, and we now have our full 100 galaxies, full 100 Milky Ways, um, with something like 400 satellites around them. Um, and we are frantically writing up our last papers. If I wasn't teaching this semester, we'd be moving a little faster, um, but trying to get our final um, survey results out. So let's talk about those final survey results. Here are lovely images of satellites from those 36 hosts, um, but let's talk about them in the context of the questions that I chatted about before. So the, what I'll do is I'll talk about results from the first half, so the, the cosmology, and then I'll talk about uh, the results from the galaxy formation side. So the question on the cosmology side is how many satellites are there? And then asking whether or not those agree with um, that cold dark matter, the, the, the properties of dark matter that we understand. 
So on the left, this is the number of satellites in each of our hosts. Each color is a different Milky Way host. And the number of satellites as a function of how bright they are. So I have flipped this. Now faint is on this side and bright is on that side. The Milky Way itself lies kind of right in the middle of this rainbow, which is really quite interesting. The plot on the right is asking how many satellites, this is the number of satellites in a given Milky Way, as a function of how bright that host was, that is how bright the Milky Way host was. So the Milky Way is this black star here. This is how bright the Milky Way itself is. And the Milky Way has five satellites down to our limits. And so you can kind of see the Milky Way again, sitting kind of in the middle of everything. And so what we found, this is the first of our conclusions is that first of all, a Milky Way like galaxy has a pretty wide range of satellites. So we found some Milky Ways that had no satellites and some Milky Ways that had almost 10 satellites. With the Milky Way at five, it's sitting like kind of lovely right in the middle. The Milky Way itself is consistent with having been drawn from the Saga population. That is, the Milky Way is totally normal um, in this context, in the context of how many satellites it has. So that's really interesting. That's a piece of information we didn't know before. We can now do the same thing, but compare that to numerical simulations. So here is a numerical simulation. Um, the gray, the, what is that? Maybe a dark blue, light blue. I don't even know what that color is. Anyway, um, this is sort of the range that simulations would predict. This is the number of satellites. And this is the number of Saga hosts that we would expect to have with that number. So for example, um, we would expect to have, you know, a, a, a Milky Way that has two satellites. We'd expect that the Saga survey should have somewhere between three to eight sat um, systems with two satellites. And we'd only expect to have one or zero systems that have 10 or more satellites. So that's the prediction. And here are the Saga results. And so the stars are the satellites we found. And then the dots on top of those are, we know that we didn't get redshift distances for everything. So this is um, accounting for some incompleteness. And so we find that the Saga systems are broadly in agreement with numerical predictions. And those numerical predictions are assuming that dark matter has that one um, proton mass um, gravitationally um, interacting only, so a cold dark matter particle. So that's pretty cool. So Saga is suggesting that we are basically in agreement with predictions. So that is on the cosmology side. And at the very beginning of the talk, we were discussing monkey wrenches. So there's no monkey wrench on the cosmology side, but that's not true on the galaxy formation side. So on the galaxy formation side, we wanted to ask, are galaxies star forming or are they have they ceased forming stars? Um, so again, here, um, looking at these two images, the very blue sort of bumpier one is a, a galaxy that is forming stars actively and a, this red sort of smoother one um, is not. Um, we define a galaxy as being quenched that is not forming stars based on our spectrum. Um, and our spectrum can tell whether or not there's stars even at a fairly low level. And so what I'm gonna do next is show you a plot where we are gonna color code the, the points based on whether it's star forming or whether it's not star forming. So this is as a function of distance away from the primary Milky Way and the, um, for, the vertical axis is brightness. The blue dots are star forming galaxies and the bluer, the more star forming it is. The red dots are galaxies that are not forming stars. And the sort of more pinkish ones are ones that are kind of right on the edge. The open circles are things that we didn't get spectra for, but we think are satellites. And we'll just assume that all of those are not forming stars. Even if they are all not forming stars, the majority of these points and the majority of satellites in the Saga survey are forming stars. And that is not true from what we see in the Milky Way. Um, and this is where the monkey wrench thing comes in. So um, putting that and plotting that in a different way. So now I am plotting as a function of the satellite's mass so brighter satellites, uh, fainter satellites. 
Um, this is the fraction of things that are not forming stars. So if all of your satellites are quenched, they're all not forming stars, you'd have a fraction up here of one. If absolutely everything was forming stars, the quench fraction would be zero. The Milky Way, and if you add M31 to, the Milky Way um, fractions are higher, right? So we knew that the Magellanic clouds were forming stars. Most of the, the other satellites are not forming stars. So that's the orange region. The Saga stuff is green, and those um, the dots are our measurements. The sort of darker green for our version is our errors, that is sort of um, our observational errors. And then the lighter green points are assuming that everything we miss is a quenched galaxy. That's probably not true. You know, that's, that's trying to be conservative. But even if absolutely everything that we didn't find was quenched, our quench fractions, that is we are finding far more star forming satellites um, than is in the Milky Way, which is really interesting. If we compare our points, so these points are the same now as the observations, this is the same plot, the yellow or yellow, gosh, the red and the sort of turquoisey thing are predicted simulations. So these predicted simulations agree with the Milky Way. They don't agree with our Saga stuff. Now the question is, are the simulations kind of maybe subconsciously or maybe not subconsciously tuned to get uh, reproduce the Milky Way? And so if the Saga results are true and the Milky Way is for some reason more quenched, that means that the simulations are slightly off. And so this is right now a bit of a, um, we we'll call it a debate. People know about the SOG results. They're like, oh, we might have to deal with that. But most people are waiting for our larger sample. Um, and as a spoiler, our 100 um, sample, we're seeing very, very similar results. So the SOG satellites are more star forming, both in the predictions and from the Milky Way itself. Um, and that's kind of cool. I have a couple more slides. And so just to kind of summarize the Saga survey. So the results I showed you, those were with the 36 complete hosts. Those are published results. Um, we have taken our last data for the, um, for the survey. So the survey was completed last month. We now have 102 hosts. Preliminary results suggest that everything I said is gonna hold, but just with smaller error bars. So here we are, we've published stage one and stage two. Stage three, we are just about to publish. Um, we're still working through the data and creating plots. And so in my second to last slide, I kind of wanted to say what we're doing next. What does the future look like um, for Saga survey? So the next step, and we're just starting to prepare for this. I had a meeting for a couple hours yesterday to discuss. What we want to do is start studying. We now have the satellites. We know where they are. We have kind of, is it star forming or is it not? but we wanna study those satellites in much greater detail. And so in the next two weeks, we have an observing run at Palomar on, I forget, October 20th or something like that, not, not far off. What we're gonna do is start getting spectra of those satellites at much higher resolution. That is um, spectra that are much finer detail. And the idea will be to measure the dynamical masses, actually how much do these galaxies weigh? And that should be able to tell us a lot about both how many stars are in those galaxies versus how much uh, dark matter is in those galaxies. It will also allow us to measure their chemical compositions in much greater detail. And so here is an example of that. So here's a galaxy, here is a spectrum, and this white line is an emission line um, from gas in that galaxy. You can kind of maybe see Maybe I should have made a line so your eye could see that that, that line is slightly tilted. Um, what you're seeing, yeah, maybe you can't, sorry, just imagine it. Um, that galaxy is actually rotating around. And the fact that this emission line is slightly tilted means you're seeing it at different velocities. And so you can actually measure how fast the galaxy is, is moving. And that gives us some estimate of its total mass. And so that is something that we are just starting in a couple of weeks. We'd like to measure the masses of all of our galaxies and give us some information about both their um, total masses, which will tell us a little bit about their star formation and their um, formation history, as well as give us some more details on their chemical composition. So we'll see how that goes. Huh. Um, so to wrap up, 
um, we, I started out the whole talk saying about these two questions, trying to answer a question in cosmology and galaxy information. And I think the Saga survey has done pretty well at answering these questions. So the question was, what is the nature of dark matter? And we find that the Saga systems are consistent with predictions from cosmological simulations that assume a dark matter particle that is a cold particle um, that is a cold dark matter particle and that the Milky Way itself is consistent with Saga. That is the things that we are assuming from Milky Way are probably right, at least on the dark matter side. On the galaxy formation side, we have found that the Saga satellites are much more quenched than the Milky Way. Um, and that perhaps we need to re-examine some of the simulations um, in terms of how star formation proceeds in those and not assume that the Milky Way is sort of the end of the story there. And so I could end on this slide, but it's not as pretty as this slide. Um, and in fact, to me, it's not even as pretty as this slide. Um, so this are the people who are in the Saga survey. We have we were on Zoom before Zoom was fashionable, but um, the team is all over the place. Risa Wexler, um, who is got this is like a double background, um, is a professor at Stanford, is my co-PI, as well as Gao Yun Mao, who is at Utah. Um, I will pause and I will take questions. Professor, Professor Marla, th thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. And I see lots of questions in the chat as well. Yep. Kurt, Curtis, you had you you had a question. Would you would you step in? Curtis? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, well, okay, as your talk developed, I think it was partly answered for me. It appeared to me early in the talk that you were selecting uh, satellite galaxies basically upon how blue they were. And I was, uh, I had the question, well, if, if these satellite galaxies, if most of them have stopped star formation, then why are they blue and not red? Yeah, so there's blue and there's blue and there's red and there's red. Um, so we select color based on, um, we call it blue, um, but what we mean is bluer than a very, very high redshift galaxy, which is very red. So our color selection allows for star formation and for the reddest not star forming galaxy that's nearby. So that is our, our color selection allows for absolutely quenched galaxies. And in fact, we go out a little farther than that. The color selection that we, that we uh, impose gets rid of galaxies that are very, very high redshift, which are much redder than absolutely possible in the nearby universe. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Great. Other questions? Okay, I'll ask a I'll ask a funny one. I was noticing the difference you showed between the the model's prediction and the observations. Mm -hmm. And you know, obviously the models can be wrong. But uh, is there kind of a rule of thumb in astronomy in terms of very general factors, maybe like high redshift, where the observations aren't expected to be terribly accurate? And therefore, you'd accept a greater deviation. Um, so, what we try and do both in the observations and in the simulations is to kind of assess the scatter in mm -hmm. those um, predictions. And so, um, the simulations, if you run the same simulation a thousand times with different starting points, you'll have some scatter in the prediction. Um, and so, and that's kind of what I was trying to show here, um, let me go back for a sec. Let me just um, go back to an early slide here. So here was the, so if you look at the gray lines, this is the range of predictions for the number of satellites in a Milky Way in a given simulation with um, cold dark matter and initial conditions that are all roughly the same. So that scatter is in the prediction. And sort of, you actually can see there's a blue region in, uh, inside of those individual points. Um, that's the scatter in the predicted 
values. And so if your observations are within that blue zone, you're good. Um, the red line is the Milky Way. It has a huge scatter around it because it's just one observation. And so what we're trying to do is instead of have one red line, have a hundred red lines and compare those hundred red lines to those thousand gray lines and see if things line up. I'm not sure I answered your question. No, I think you did. I, it, must, it must be based on the phenomena itself and the model. Of the dependency on this strange factor I'm looking for must be consistent between observations and, and models. Yeah, so we both have errors. The, the observers have errors. The modelers have errors. Some of those are we know about. Some mm -hmm. of them we don't know about. And those are the ones that we're always thinking about. What is the inherent bias or the sort of where things could go mm -hmm. wrong? Um, and that's where I spend most of my time is trying to think of how we could mess this up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, maybe you covered it and I missed it in the presentation, but isn't there a, a selection bias for star forming dwarfs in, in your data because they're brighter? Uh, yeah, so yes, um, that's where Palomar comes in. So we make sure that we get every galaxy down to a certain magnitude, um, which is uh, way lower than um, that, that difference. So the difference between the same galaxy that's star forming and not star forming, it's about a quarter magnitude or so. And so we get spectra down to um, a certain limit. And then we consider ourselves complete about a half a magnitude brighter than that. And so we think that we are complete for both star forming and not star forming things down to the limits that we quote. Okay, um, thank you. And, so, and we're very worried about that. And that's actually where Palomar has really played a gigantic role is trying to make sure that we aren't missing any of those not star forming galaxies. And again, that's also why um, you know, I was saying here, when we say we miss galaxies, let's see, it was in this slide. Um, you know, I so I noted these open circles are galaxies where we didn't get a spectrum, um, but they're in the survey. Um, this gray zone, we actually get spectra down into this gray zone, but we don't say that we're complete in that gray zone. We only say we're complete above it. Um, and we say that, okay, there is some bias in getting a spectra for a quenched galaxy versus a star forming galaxy. So let's assume every single one of those circles is quenched. And that's where our error bars and that's where our conclusions are, are still coming from. It's probably not true. Some of those open circles are probably star forming, but we try and tilt in that direction to account for exactly for what you're saying. Okay, I see, thank you. Other questions, anybody? Please jump in. Please jump in with a question. Well, can I then? Can I ask um, if if you would if you would tell us something about <clears throat> the Warrior Scholar Project? Oh, yeah. sure. And related, there's there's yeah. the yeah. So yeah. let me. I'll tell you a story. Um. So, uh. I am a professor. I have graduate students. I have to pay for those graduate students. Um, and so the way I pay for those graduate students is I apply to the National Science Foundation for grants. And when I apply for National Science Foundation for grants, you have to write two pages. It's a 15 page proposal. One of those pages is called broader impacts, you know, or it's some kind of outreach um, thing. And every professor you've ever talked to has to do that. And it was about 10 years ago, I was writing my broader impacts and it wasn't very satisfying. Um, and I read a story in the Yale Daily News um, about Warrior Scholar Project. Um, they had just started, it was two guys, um, one who was actually in the Australian military and one, uh, his brother. The, um, the veteran had just gotten into Yale and the brother gave him like a two day download of how to get, you know, how to survive in college. And they realized that any veteran coming back into school needed this. And so they, I don't know, it was probably a total disaster that first week. They came up with a curriculum and did a one week boot camp for like nine veterans. Anyway, I read about it in Daily News. I called them. I was like, you guys need some science? They were like, yeah, sure. Um, and so I started um, working with them and designing a science program. 
Fast forward 10 years, it's now a nonprofit organization. There's 20 full-time employees. They run on 25 campuses, um, doing running one-week boot camps um, for enlisted veterans um, that are using their GI Bill to get back into undergrad. Um, and so about half of those programs are science programs. I helped design that the science curriculum. Um, and it's really amazing. So, uh, you know, a lot of the, the enlisted veterans uh, coming back, 40% of GI Bill money goes to for-profit colleges. That should boil anyone's blood who hears that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's mostly because the students are not, just don't know, um, and they, they don't know that they can apply to, you know, the Ivies and get in. Um, and so most of that one week of Warrior Scholar is just telling them how awesome they are and that they should apply to Yale. Um, we've got, I think, 15 Warrior Scholar alum um, who are undergrads now. One of them is in my class. Um, and so it's been a lot of fun. Um, and uh, the research experience that you mentioned at the beginning of the class came out of that as well. Um, and so I had eight veterans on campus this summer doing research in a bunch of labs, including my own. Um, and that was funded by the Howard Hughes Medical. Um, and they actually helped fund some of my own research and some of my graduate students as well. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. Um, let me, I will here. It's warriorscholar.org. A remarkable program. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. How, how, did, how does someone get in? Into the uh, so uh, apply and every it's a free program. So if you, um, you know, if you have someone who you think would benefit, uh, they just apply and it's fully funded. Um, so travel and housing is funded during the week. Wow, tremendous. With that, are there other questions, other comments? Yeah, this is Mark. I've, I've got uh, one comment. Um, we have, do star parties frequently, and uh, you might be amazed at the number of people that assume that all galaxies are the same size. <laughs> and uh, with the reappearance of um, Andromeda, that's become a, a big point of discussion, especially when you point out they have satellite galaxies, and most people don't understand how a satellite, how, how galaxy can have a satellite galaxy. It's all tied together. So, you know, we, we get in some really good discussions with this. The, the one thing that I really appreciate from your talk that I've missed out on is is the brightness um, feature from star forming and non star forming galaxies, because mm. uh, again the general assumption I think is that they they think that a, a galaxy is dimmer it's because it's farther away. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not necessarily true. It, it could be two galaxies could be the same distance away, but one's still forming stars and one's not. So that gives me a little more ammunition for our discussion. So I really appreciate that. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank you for your work with the veterans. And, and you're right. Uh, it doesn't seem right that 40% of the GI Bill money goes to for-profit colleges. Probably marketing and probably lack of confidence on the part of the students. Exactly. Exactly. And Clark Williams had a question. How do ah, so? How do you how do you estimate the brightness of the Milky Way? That's actually really really hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, so and not my job, which is kind of awesome. Um, there are a couple other groups that try to estimate the brightness of the Milky Way, and they do it all different ways. Um, uh, what was the one that we were work using last? I even forget. Um, I think it's in the infrared. It's a little easier to estimate the total brightness. Um, you can use uh, models and, you know, looking at other galaxies, but it's really a, a genuine hodgepodge um, to try and get the, the brightness of the Milky Way and even a bit of a controversy. And so we get around that by just allowing a range in brightness. So we say, well, the Milky Way, it's published, you know, this value, this value, and that value. And so we'll just bracket all of the published values and use the, you know, that range in brightness for our analogs. Um, so, so we kind of skirt around that and it, it's not, I don't work on that just because it is a really hard problem. <laughs>
much easier to estimate the total brightness of any other galaxy except the Milky Way. Yeah. Other questions? Well, Professor Marla Gia, thank you very much. Wonderful presentation um, and a wonderful project. And, and as Kin said, thank you for the work with the veterans. Um, you've been very generous with your time. And I think we probably now need to wind the meeting down. So if there are no, no further questions or comments, let me conclude with a word about our next meeting. <clears throat> the Greenway Talks Online will continue on Saturday, October 22nd, when the Pathfinder lander successfully reached Mars more than 20 years ago, it began a Martian renaissance of sorts that continues to this day. Rob Manning, chief engineer for Pathfinder and now chief engineer at JPL, has been deeply involved in the technical design of nearly every US Mars mission since Pathfinder. But as Rob has argued, the stunning accomplishments of recent years were enabled by the many things that we learned from our mistakes. On October 22nd, Rob will draw upon his more than 40 years experience at JPL to show us how failure helps us succeed. So please join us in two weeks. Thank you again, Professor Marla Gia. And thanks to everyone for being here and for supporting the Greenway Talks. With that, everybody say goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good afternoon. Thank you again. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye bye.